I think uh, her greatest relevance uh, and strength is, is people discover themselves and they say, wow, I am entitled to my own life. Uh, Self-interest is good. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV. Today we're talking with John Aguilaro. He is the producer, the man, the auteur behind the Atlas Shrug trilogy, the third installment of which comes out on September 12th, 2014. To everyone within the range of my voice, this is John Galt speaking. Those who have left you are eager to build a world of freedom. It's the end. No, it's the beginning. John, thanks for talking to Reason. Absolutely. How does it feel to have brought the Atlas Shrugged trilogy to completion? This, you bought the rights to this in 1992, and you're almost done with it. It's inspirational. Uh, it's something that I know that Ayn Rand would have wanted to do. Hmm. Uh, she tried uh, with uh, a number of people. Including herself, right? She left a partly finished script. She actually or had a, a, wrote a part of a script, yeah. uh, part of a play. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in the end, she wasn't. She did not want to give up creative control. Right. That really was the thing that prevented the movie from being made. There were a couple of producers, Al Ruddy, <laughs> who produced The Godfather. One in particular, they actually had a news conference it's back <laughs> in '72, I believe. They announced they're going to make the movie and all of that, but. The creative control was, was a tough one for her. So you were lucky enough then to buy the rights after she had expired. It was August of 1992. I went to Hollywood to some of the, you know, got, got into yeah. some of the studio chiefs and talked to them. And some were uh, explicitly said, can't happen. We, we, won't, we won't get box office. Was it based on the idea that the, move, the book was unfilmable, that it, the creative control issue was gonna be a problem? Or, or is it that they didn't like the message? Well, because you always yeah. hear about it, you know, Angelina Jolie or Oliver Stone or any number of yeah. liberal Hollywood types, you know, who love Ayn Rand and talk about this book as huge. So what, what was their hesitation? I, yeah, I, I think she had two uh, opponents. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one from the left. So the left does not like, endorse free markets, mm -hmm. limited government. Those words scare the left politically. Mm -hmm. So they were in charge of making a movie and, didn't, and felt a hesitancy to want to do that. Now, they felt it would be a box office success. They're not idiots. They yeah. would have done it. The, the other side was from, I think, the, the right, from, from the religious side of the right. Mm -hmm. uh, right after the book was published in 1957, you know, she, she got a lot of pushback mm -hmm. uh, on the fact that she was an atheist. So tell me, though, how does it feel, uh, you know, so you, you finished the three movies. The first two have not been reviewed well. I mean, they've been critically kind of admonished. Uh, box office has been pretty good uh, by your reckoning? No, or? no, no. It was, it was trashed, as you say, yep. uh, and, um, and box office was, was, has been low. What has been interestingly high has been the DVD sale mm -hmm. and the um, rental. The after box office sales, and, and part of that suffered because, you know, in Hollywood you put up a movie, you put up 100 million or more, a big part of your budget, 20, 30 million or more, is, is advertising. Mm -hmm. And we had limited funds for that. Talk about the relevance, because I mean, you're you're right that you know this this is a type of project that has a huge afterlife, and it's kind of inspirational in the sense of you know people who read Ayn Rand and people who read Atlas Shrugged in particular. It's one of those books that uh, a lot of people describe it as life changing. You know, it just blows people's minds. What's the relevance of Rand to contemporary America and? Um, you know, and to the people who are renting and buying uh, the Atlas Shrugged movies? I think uh, her greatest relevance uh, and strength is, is people discover themselves. And in an intrinsic and explicit way. And they say, wow, I am entitled to my own life. Uh, Self-interest is good. And I think that's been the most overwhelming 
uh, aspect of your question. So that, I mean, it's, it's interesting that you put it in that sense because Ayn Rand is usually talked about as the, the goddess of the market or whatever, but what you're talking about is something that is, uh, you know, it can be expressed in kind of economic terms, but it's actually much more basic and fundamental. And the Declaration of Independence said, Thomas Jefferson, mm -hmm. life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And yet, we're taught uh, at, at, at schools, universities, we're taught uh, at churches that self-interest uh, is a, a vice. Mm -hmm. Selfishness is a, a vice. What is wrong with the caricature? And you see this uh, both on the, the religious right as well as on the progressive left. People saying, well, you know what Ayn Rand is really all about is, is self-interest, is selfishness. It's about egoism. It's about me, mm -hmm. me, me. I, I think Ayn Rand made a mistake. She stuck with the vernacular mm -hmm. of the word selfishness. Mm -hmm. So rather than spending uh, all the time that she did and her, her team, mm -hmm. her collective as they right. ironically called them, uh, on saying enlightened self-interest, saying ethical self-interest, uh, you know, qualifying in some way, but to stay with that word selfishness mm -hmm. it's in the vernacular as negative you are you know you're a hardcore libertarian uh, do, do you consider yourself an objectivist as well yes i would say i am an objectivist slash libertarian so you have a political philosophy or a, a, a personal and political philosophy that is all about freedom and individual rights how do you take your philosophy which is before politics and then how do you choose how to express it in politics well, I, I express it as a libertarian. Uh, first of all, it's easier to do. Mm -hmm. the, the libertarian movement, libertarian thought is no longer fringe. Mm -hmm. it's, it's out there. And uh, it expresses itself to one of two parties, mm -hmm. generally Republican. So I will generally vote Republican. So, and you don't see any uh, issue, or you don't see any hope for the Democrats to become more free trade, more laissez-faire in terms of economics? I've got a friend over 50 years, he, uh, between 50 and 60, uh, 60 years. He is a um, ultra-left liberal. He'll come back to me and say, in essence, markets are messy. Uh, uh, they're untidy. And too many people are going to slip through the, 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 the safety net. And that's why I don't like your market capitalism thing. Yeah. And so the other side, as much as they cause angst with us entrepreneur market types, uh, they have a position that they believe in. I think it's incorrect, but they're Americans. They love George Washington like I do, <laughs> and they're just wrong about their economics. Well, let's talk about economics and, and your business history. You started out selling snow cones, and then uh, when did you first realize that you had both an interest in being and a talent for being an entrepreneur and for being a businessman. Yeah, it, it was very young. I mean, I, like so many entrepreneurs, we cut lawns. I would pick uh, uh, blackberries in a, uh, an old farm uh, area and uh, got permission to go through there and I would get pints and do them. It was, it was, um, it was a great feeling mm -hmm. to put out effort work and then be able to buy my own ice cream cone mm -hmm. or uh, you know, take my girlfriend out to the movies and get some popcorn. I, I like that. I like the control of that. Um, and so it, uh, yeah, I, I went in my old hometown, Collingswood, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I would get on a bus, uh, take a few miles trip to an ice station, get crushed ice, 50 pound bag, put it on my back put it in the bus, take it back, put it on a wagon, get some flavors, and in front of the mayor's office of Collingswood, New Jersey, allowed me on our main street, and I sold uh, snow cones. That was the beginning of it. And So I, what, what is the essence of an entrepreneur? Yeah, yeah, and I've, been, I've thought about people. I, I, think, uh, I think an entrepreneur, they have a gift for knowing what's around the corner. They're uh, risk-adverse people have to get to the corner, peer around, take a look, you know, double check, mm -hmm. triple check, and then they know what direction to go. Entrepreneurs just have an uncanny ability to take data and a sense of history 
or pieces of current data and, and make a guess. They're often wrong, but they're generally are right and they're paid well for whatever product or service mm -hmm. they put in the market that people voluntarily want to buy and that makes them good, honest, charitable, moral people in spite of the crap that people say about them. They're, they're essentially great human beings, entrepreneurs. Talk about cronyism and crony capitalism because that's a huge, you know, in Atlas Shrugged, it's not necessarily the, you know, poor people who are on welfare, they're not the villains. It's actually the incredibly well-connected businessmen and the politicians who want to play ball with each other. It's probably almost impossible to get rid of cronyism. Mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, we, we, the, the government itself has large contracts. There's bridges to be built, mm -hmm. uh, buildings, military to support with services and supplies. All of this is going on. And uh, uh, each of these companies belong to industries mm -hmm. that hire lobbyists right. to get the laws and bidding contracts done in just the same way uh, and, and just the way they would like. So it's easy and proper to shoot cronyism. Mm -hmm. so I'm not saying you won't. That's not going to happen. But, if, but the size of government is 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 going to create an environment where it'll be impossible to get rid of it. Mm. What we need to do, I think, just to follow up, is I think we need a simple tax. I'm not saying a flat tax. I think a flat tax is a, again, that's a four-letter word. A lot of people don't view that as the answer. But I think you, to get to the mountaintop, you got to take you got to get halfway there first. So when you say a simple tax, what what do you mean? Uh, I mean, there'll probably be rather. I, we're not going to get a postcard, mm -hmm. but I think we can get three, four pages mm -hmm. tax code rather than a hundred thousand page tax yeah. code by having some level of progressivity. So mm -hmm. if you make a million dollars a year, you're going to pay four hundred thousand, forty percent. If you make fifty thousand a year, you're going to pay eight mm percent. -hmm. So progressivity, yeah. you can't. Y Again, you got to get halfway there to the mountain. So that gets, uh, I mean, that would clarify, that would, that would uh, get rid of a lot of um, uh, incentives that the government can build into, or sweetheart deals that the government can build uh, exactly. in. Exactly. How do you restrain but, 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 spending then? Uh, the, the, the dollar that the government gets, for every dollar of tax, what does it get? Probably 60 cents? Well, where the hell's the other 40% go? Mm -hmm. But we don't need the, the amount of regulation I mean, let's at least pick up the low-hanging fruit first. Let's right. go for that first. Yeah. But I think if we do that, that will get rid of a lot of the cronyism mm -hmm. um, by having those having having the tax revenues jump because you're taking the cost out of collecting money by the government. You also uh, run executive health exams or EHE. A lot of your uh, your businesses are are interested in this kind of quality of life and, and particularly physical life. Do you think the interest in kind of life extension or, you know, kind of, I mean, this is true self-ownership of, you know, it's your body, um, you, you know, you better take care of it, it uh, every bit as much as you take care of your car or your house. Uh, does that fit in with a kind of Randian uh, enlightened self-interest? I've never thought of it in that way, but I think you're right. It's a very good observation uh, that we take care of our minds she says, through our ability to have independence, to choose responsibly the direction we want to go in life, and our mental sense of life helps with that. But to do that, you've got to carry on a healthy life. And, I mean, it started out, it would give people exams and kind of help them figure out what was, you know, what they needed to work on in order to Yeah, I, I think the instincts were very good at the time because the the capital, the people who put up the, not the doctors, but the yeah. people who put up the capital were insurance companies and banks. And the insurance companies, in their own rudimentary way, were saying, you can pay less insurance if you get, if we can check you out, if you get a physical exam. And, and that, that idea has, has value, and it took off, uh, and it's as valuable today as it was then. And in many ways more so, right? Because we can actually change, I mean, you can, if you can identify a particular problem, you're much more likely to be able to fix it. Right, and not just by having expensive operations or expensive drugs. We know that celiac disease can be beaten 
by abstinence. Mm -hmm. Don't eat wheat laden bread. Talk about the role of uh, William uh, Howard Taft in uh, the Life Extension Institute. Well, William Howard Taft, President Taft, was the worst example uh, <laughs> one could have as their poster child for Life Extension Institute at the time. Although he lived a pretty long time. He, yeah, he did. Yeah. He did. He did. Uh, we 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 wrote a book about uh, at the 75th anniversary mm -hmm. uh, of. Uh, we also just wrote a hundredth anniversary. My beloved wife Joan Carter wrote that book. She also wrote a book called the The Making of Atlas Shrug Trilogy. But she wrote a book on um, uh, helped assist with a hundredth. But we wrote a seventy-fifth anniversary book, and President Taft is there. He helped form this company, mm -hmm. and I think he also helped form a a sense uh, a, ju a, a judgment that checking out your body periodically is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And so with that basic idea, he, as the first chairman of the Board of Trustees, uh, we were founded. Well, let's end with a, a kind of a discussion of the future. I mean, in, in a way, libertarians, broadly speaking, a lot of uh, people who are fans of Ayn Rand, always talk about the current moment as the absolute worst possible moment to be alive. You know, government has never been so big and so intrusive. Things have never been so awful. You mentioned that Rand is really about optimism and that that optimism that she had about creating a life that you want to live gets beaten out of them, beaten out of kids. They forget the optimism of when life was ahead of them. Um, you've just completed a major, major pro you know, project, a life's project with the Atlas Shrugged Trilogy. Do you still have optimism? What's still ahead of you? Uh, I'm absolutely optimistic. I think about what we've done in the last 100 years, 300 years, 500 years. The, the wars and the monarchies and the churches and battle. And look at today with the extremism. But uh, we'll be here in uh, a century or five centuries or the next millennia, uh, millennium, and uh, it'll, uh, living will be a lot better than it is now. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We'll leave it there. I want to thank John Aguilaro. He is the man behind the Atlas Shrug Trilogy. He's also uh, the chairman of Cybex and Executive Health Exams. John, thanks for talking to Reason TV. Enjoy it. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.